Welcome to the Great American Epic, where we discuss The Walking Dead. As before, we'll pick up from where we were last time. This is part three of the lecture, Rick and the Spiritual Climax. I want to circle back now to my opening quotation, what Rick says to the first zombie he encounters on his first day in this new, strange, mythical world. The line was, quote, I'm sorry this happened to you. Let's finish with our time now in hell. Glenn's head is bashed in by Negan's baseball bat. In the process, one of his eyes bulges. Gore and the way people die, this is all also usually symbolic in The Walking Dead, richly meaningful. The bulging eye here indicates Glenn is wide awake. He does not get to be killed in his sleep as he killed others. On the contrary. In Dante's Hell, the way characters suffer also has symbolic meaning. The technique is referred to as contrapasso, and generally they suffer in parallel or contrasting ways to their sins. It's contrapasso for Glenn's eye to bones. Also, it suggests his consciousness of what has been done is heightened here instead of minimized. But what I am in the process of doing to bring things back to the center of this lecture is telling the crucial part of Rick's story that bears on our understanding of the epic's spiritual climax and hence our understanding of the epic overall. Rick is our primary hero. His is, from season one to season nine, the definitive quest and a spiritual journey as much as anything else. Here, in this, quote, last day on earth, we have registered the moment, in both senses of the word, of his brutal condemnation as both person and leader. Before going on to tell the other half, the other side, the rest of Rick's story, I want to call attention to the words he says to the man he falsely believes is Negan at the end of the killing mission at that satellite station when he thinks, little does he know, that it's all over. By the way, it's worth mentioning the symbolism of the fact that the outpost is a satellite station. The first time we see it, in the middle of the night, amidst a trinity of red warning lights, it points upward, chillingly, to the sky, as though to tell us someone is watching. What is about to happen is not going unseen by something higher. It's not a satellite station for nothing, this setting. No detail in The Walking Dead is for nothing. What Rick says at the end of the killing spree to the man he thinks is Negan, not long before he is about to descend into hell on earth, echoes in a pointed and perverse way that line I opened this lecture with, what he said to the zombie in the pilot, quote, I'm sorry this happened to you. That was, if we recall, an expression of Tenderness, compassion, sorrow, consciousness, even grace. A sort of heavenliness piercing through into the horrifying new world. That was day one for Rick in the general zombie underworld. Now, at the satellite station, on day one of his descent into the particular underworld, the hell we have been discussing. What he says to the last man standing just before he executes him as well is, quote, I'm sorry it had to come to this. Not, I'm sorry this happened to you, but I'm sorry it had to come to this. That's obviously a deliberate echo. It didn't have to come to this, of course. That's the point. 
That's why hell is coming. As Morgan said at the church meeting before everyone just went along, quote, we aren't trapped in this. None of us is trapped in this. Those were laden words too, since Rick and the gang themselves are soon to go through a period of being terrorized through a series of experiences precisely of being trapped. And what else is hell, after all, except inescapable? But, in a way, it did have to come to this, too. We've known Rick from the beginning. We've seen what he's been through. We've watched him bear a burden no one should have to bear, do things no one should have to do, not if the world were free from Luciferian influence. We've seen him try, in faith, in conscience, even in spirit and grace and graciousness. So when he says, quote, I'm sorry it had to come to this, it's not just ironic, a contrast to his earlier sympathetic line to the dead woman. Rick is speaking for us, in a sense. We are sorry it had to come to this for him. Nobody, no good viewer, wanted to see Rick or Glenn or anyone else down on their knees, trembling, guilty, and horrified. Nor did anyone, not any good viewer, want to see Rick lose himself, become cocky, become merciless. His true friend Morgan certainly didn't, and neither did we. On that day, what's called the last day on earth, Rick spends a good amount of time with Morgan, whom he also spent a good amount of time with on his first day in the apocalypse. Morgan, during the time they have on Rick's last day on earth, tries to talk sense into him. He tells him, quote, people can come back, Rick. He knows who Rick was, knows Rick is gone, knows what it's like to be gone. Rick's coming to realize that he, quote, didn't end it. Morgan tells him intently, quote, no, you started something. When Morgan says this, Rick, notably, looks up at the sky and then looks forward with the first signs of fear on his face and then looks down at the ground in perplexity and subconscious guilt. It's a circle, Morgan tells him. People get to return. Morgan then shares the secret of how he saved the life of a man Rick had wanted to kill, how that man, in turn, saved the life of a doctor in the group, and how that doctor, in turn, saved the life of Carl, Rick's son. Quote, it's all a circle, is Morgan's interpretation. I'm sorry it had to come to this, Rick says to the guy he thinks is Negan before he shoots him in the head, echoing the words he said to the first zombie he shot in the head, quote, I'm sorry this happened to you. We're sorry this happened to Rick. And when we see him on his knees, in terror and tears, we're sorry it had to come to this, too. I'll stop here, and we'll pick up with this later.